Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode five. Hello, hello. Of the After Class podcast. We got a good one for you today. Um, we, jumping. Yep. Jumping, jumping, jumping. Let's jump right into it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Jane. That was cheesy. Yeah, it was cheesy, and I loved it. Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about jumping today. We're actually going to be talking about jumping issues, actually. So problems with jumping. Why do they happen? Some of the common jumping problems that we see. Um, we uh, had a little bit of a chit chat before we pressed record here and um we started to realize that there's actually quite a lot there's a lot to cover which i'm which i'm stoked about because there's lots of really great uh, content and information here so i think whether you're um an experienced agility person or whether you're a new agility person i i think that there'll be a few things that you'll be able to take from today's podcast in terms of of some jumping things so what we did is we sort of went over a couple of the not actually a couple several <laughs> lots <laughs> lots of jumping issues that we have seen or we've also experienced with our own dogs and we've sort of categorized them in a way um that they're either like a natural jumping issue so the dogs just kind of are that way, um, which can be fixed in some cases, and then in other cases, they can't really be. Or um, whether it's an, a handler created issue, which is way more common and usually can be fixed, but lots of people create issues with their jumping just because lack of experience or handling or reward placement, Rewarding. which we're probably going to say till you're irritated with us today. But um, yeah, so we'll go through a couple of the jumping issues that we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about um, jumping like head head uh, placement for dogs, dogs that jump with their head too high, dogs that look at their handlers and what um, issues that can make. Those can be things that are like natural that the dog wants to do just kind of on their own. A lot of that though is is handler created. Um, we're talking about dogs that um, run too much in extension or dogs that run too much in collection and kind of what that means and why that happens. Um, dogs that over jump. So dogs that jump higher over the bars than they actually need to. Um, it's, Bouncy. Yeah, cute, but not efficient. Uh, not efficient at all. Um, what else, Jim? Toe danglers, um, <laughs> which creates bar knocking and yeah. that um, we feel it can be created, but sometimes natural. Mm -hmm. um, late takeoff, again, natural, but sometimes created. Yes. And then early takeoff. Yeah. That can be a tough one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about um, about early takeoff and some of the experiences we've had with that over the years because that's... Um, with students' dogs. Yeah. And, and our, our own, own dogs. dogs. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, okay, so we'll go back up to the top um, and we're just going to kind of go through this a little bit. So we'll talk a little bit about um, dogs that jump with like their head high or like looking at the handler. And um, as I mentioned before, this is, some dogs are like some breeds I find are more prone to um, jumping with their head high or like being really bouncy in the way that they jump. Um, I know having a poodle, she she jumped that way naturally. She just does everything airborne, as you know. Um, and so I, I didn't want to lose time with her jumping that way. She actually had a fairly nice takeoff and landing takeoff spot but she just would go, go she would only have to jump like six inches and she would like try to clear it and she'd be like, at like 10 and 12 inches mm -hmm. it was so inefficient um so for her to work through that i jumped her at like four inches for the longest time um to teach her to run flat um the other thing that i found was extremely helpful for her for rewarding to get her head down low was to um, either put a toy on like a long rope and like drag it behind me so that she was like really like had all this prey drive wanted to, to chase it or I would uh, use a reward that I could throw that could roll or continue moving so it wasn't um, stationary. Yeah, exactly. Because mm -hmm. as soon as it was stationary, she'd be like, woohoo, pounce. And then she wanted to like attack it and, and pounce it. And you wouldn't probably get the same speed. No. And for her too, she wasn't super crazy into toys. So as soon as it would stop moving, she wasn't that interested in it anymore. Mm -hmm. So like balls were, were really helpful or frisbees. Like I had a little frisbee that had treats in it. I could throw, she'd love that. So that was really, really helpful for teaching that but i think um dogs with jumping with their head high is actually not nearly as common as dogs that jump looking at their handler and why do you think dogs jump looking at their handler well m there's two reasons main reasons why i feel anyways number one late information from the handler so the dogs are like hello where am i supposed to go and so what am i supposed to do here um and then second thing i would say is rewarding, rewarding. Mm -hmm. i find a lot of times um people who 
uh, use food as their reward, they're uh, have, rewarding from their hand or their pocket. Yes. So they like, yes. And then the dog run back, runs back and then they feed like out of their pocket or their hand. And my biggest pet peeve is when people say like sit first and then they reward. It's like, no. Late information. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You just lost your moment. Or um, also. Um, and we get it. Lots of dogs like food. So that's how you have to reward. Yeah. But what we've done to help with that is using um, like a toy that you can put food in yeah, so that you can ball. yes throw the toy with the food and that the dog's getting reward for looking straight ahead rather than coming back to the hand or mm. handler and yeah. getting rewarded for looking at the handler. Yeah, or um, in addition to that, using like a manners minder or a remote trainer mm-hmm. where you can like place it at the end of like a row of jumps or at the end of the course or whatever it might be to get the focus forward. That can be really helpful too. Um, the other thing that I find sometimes, and we see this a lot more in um, when we teach seminars than we do our own classes because we're really sticky with our own students about this is when dogs won't retrieve or they won't bring the toy back, then people don't want to throw the toy. And oh, yes. They hold on to the toy. They hold on to the toy. And mm-hmm. then that just really encourages the dogs to land and anticipate coming back to the handler. So they already start looking before they're even done. But not only – we're not going to go down this slippery slope, but not only jumping issues, we see this cause miscontacts for running contacts. We see this cause uh, pop poles mm-hmm. because people are just rewarding off their body so much. This can go into one of the other topics, though, to- uh, talking about the dogs running more in collection. Yes. Um, because yeah. The dogs aren't, you know, ever extending because they're coming back over the jump or knocking the bar at at the last jump because they're turning and looking at their handler instead of running through Mm -hmm. the uprights. Yeah. So you're going to hear like when we talk about when things are handler created, a lot of this can be solved through a bunch of different things. But the main thing is changing the location of your reward and teaching the dog to focus forward. Um, the only time that um, I would suggest that you change that up are dogs that run in extension, which I think we probably can move into next. So dogs that run too much in extension or too much in collection. So let's we're, we have more to say about collection. Mm-hmm. So um, let's talk about the extension. So as I was just saying, if you have a dog that, you know, doesn't really slow down very well. Not they're, great at turning. Yeah. Yeah, it's like driving a boat around the... Oh. <laughs> we both have experience, <laughs> experience with that. We both have run um, border staffies. And I used to say it's like running a brick a with brick, legs. Yes. Like, they're like, yabba dabba do legs is where we came up with that that term from Funky and Wink. But um, they just don't turn well. I, I wouldn't actually say those dogs um, jumped in. They didn't run an extension all the time, though. They just sucked at turning because mm-hmm. their body shape. Yeah, they, yeah, they were a bit more... Um, heavier chested. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. More heavy in the front. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor girls. Um, what I was thinking when I when I said this, though, running in, in extension are those dogs that basically like they are not good at naturally slowing down. Like if they go into a turn, they just run full tilt into the turn instead mm-hmm. of like actually adjusting. And you have to give very early information. And heavy information. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. To help them get into that turn and dig in. Yeah. So for those dogs, a lot of the time, and you kind of like, we tend to be attracted to those dogs because we like the powerful, like explosive mm-hmm. type of agility dogs. But we also, we also, I can think, appreciate a tight turn. Yeah. <laughs> and we love to train collection. It's uh-huh. like one of our favorite things to train. So those dogs that tend to run an extension, they need a lot more training on how to slow down. And we probably could do the, an, an entirely other podcast on teaching collection. We just don't have the time to do it today. Um, but definitely those dogs, I wouldn't be doing a lot of like going over a jump and then chucking something mm-hmm. like in, and letting them go away. I would be more prone to like raising handler focus, rewarding in front of the jump a little bit more, rewarding after the jump, toy placement, like down on the floor after the turn, those types of things, nets, you know, all of those things to kind of keep the dog more under control. Um, But I think that that's, um, in my opinion, I think that's easier to fix than a dog that wants to run in collection. Mm -hmm. And I know you, you notice the collection running a lot. I think that's something that as soon as you see something, you're always like, yeah, that dog's running in collection. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. um, we know what that means, but if like newer agility people are listening, can you describe like what running in collection is? Mm -hmm. Smaller steps. Yeah. Um, sm- smaller steps. Yeah, they, they don't actually like run. You don't see their legs kick back. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so, and sometimes dogs will do it for a couple of reasons. Like sometimes they'll do it because they're lacking confidence or understanding for sure. But some dogs just don't have the drive or like the wherewithal to like just really like get Give in it. there. Yeah. Or, and so that would be like the natural side of things, or the person's created it from. Turning. Yeah. Doing too many turns, too much collection, and not having balance with allowing the dog to extend. Mm -hmm. Um, Because 
I think that we naturally, you know, train turns or backsides, um, wraps and things like that, because those are more challenging to yep. train than extension. Yep. Extension is basically, you know, run straight and fast. Yeah. And I would say that the most common um, time that we see this is in the early phase of someone training their dog, right? Mm-hmm. So like past puppy stuff, but like once they're starting to put things together, this is when we see it most commonly because people are so focused on like the technicality part of things, like yes. you said, that the dogs sometimes learn, oh, well, you really love when I turn tight. You really love when like I slow down and I do this. So then they start to, they start to just run like reinforced all of the time yeah um or like you mentioned the style of sequence or course or whatever they're training on has like turn after turn after turn after turn and so we always talk about like sandwiching so you would do like open part to like something technical to being open open again. again so and which for some dogs even just being able to run open is as rewarding as getting a reward. Mm -hmm. So you want to be really careful about that because... And then rewarding out of the turn too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, don't just reward the collection. Yes. So either Mm -hmm. like with a tug toy and having the dog chase after you or dropping the toy and having the dog get the toy and then run after you as well. Yeah. But you really... The ideal dog in agility is a dog that knows how to switch out of extension and go to collection when they're supposed to, obviously with us cueing them as well. And then vice versa. You don't want a dog that runs mostly in one over the other mm-hmm. because that's going to impact your your overall time. And but I do th- think that the dogs have more of a natural ability to do one over the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would agree with that mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. And sometimes it's breed specific, but I mean, there's a lot of border collies that do agility. And so I don't I don't really like to say breeds like we do see lots of breeds that are a certain way and we're able to say, hey, you have this breed, watch out for this, this, and this. Like mm-hmm. we've seen so many of them. But when you talk about border collies, which is the most common dog that does agility in the level we do it anyways. Um, They're so different from each other. They're so different. You have some Border Collies, like our line of Border Collies. They're the extension line of Border Collies. It's like, whoa, Nelly, I need to teach you to slow down. They're very, very fast, which is great. But I'm not going to win if I have 800 wide turns. Or 10 bars knocked down. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) So you have to just sort of find that balance. But um, a lot of the time, as, as we're mentioning, these things are created by how people are training their dogs or how they're rewarding their dogs. And I think the most important thing with all of these jumping issues that we're going to be talking about is recognizing early that something's up and And then changing it and then adapting. adapting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think that's the hardest thing. I think some people, people really like things that are like A, B, C, D. Okay. I did that. But then they're not looking at the product that's happening and being like, Ooh, maybe I should like dial it back on this. And that's why taping is good. Oh, because sometimes yeah, you can't totally. see it in the moment and yeah. then you can go back and, you know, watch. Yeah. Or having like a coach or somebody that's mm-hmm. like able to um, recognize that and then be real with you about that, which yeah. we're going to circle back to that in, in a minute. What What do you think? We're talking about training. So what do you think about um, jump grids? Um with I like jump grids, but I wouldn't say that I they're like on the top of my like list to do with dogs, to be honest with you. Okay. And I think that might be surprising to people because I know a lot of like high level agility people that are like super into jump grids. And I have been there at times in my life, but I've also seen I've also seen um what's the word? some repercussions of doing it too much mm-hmm. uh with some dogs. And this is so I want everyone when you're listening to not just like don't let your dog fall into like every category that we're talking about because so much of this stuff is really dog dependent. So Mm -hmm. you have to like take things with a grain of salt and just like listen to everything and don't just be like, oh my God, I'm never doing jump grids again. Because there's some dogs that I believe jump grids are essential for, like overextending dogs. Yes. They should be doing jump grids. But if your dog runs in collection normally, you should not be doing jump grids. Open grids. (laughs) Yeah, open grids, straight lines that have like lots of space in between them. So yeah, I, in my own experience, I've done, I've done lots of jump grids with all of my dogs, but I, um, Grand Slam, my one Border Collie, um, great, great agility dog. But when I was first starting with him, I could see that he was going to run all in extension because he was very fast. So I ended up doing like a lot of set point exercises. And for those of you who don't know what that is, basically you have your normal jump and then you have a jump bump or like a really low jump set 
um, a specific a specific amount of feet from the actual bar. So they kind of it sort of uses like a bit of a jump bump. So they are left in a sit. They you know jump over the or step over and, or stride over the stride bar, and then they lift up over the jump. And it's it's there to create um, a nice even balance between when your dog takes off and lands. So an ideal jumping style is the dog should have equal distance on either side of the bar from where they take off and where they they land. land. And the set point is is a, is to help create that. Me being me and doing, I train everything and I get obsessive and whatever. Sometimes it's helpful to me and sometimes it's not. But in this case, it wasn't because I I trained it so much that Slam actually thought that he was supposed to take off at a certain spot no matter where where he was coming from. So if he was coming from whatever obstacle or whatever distance, he'd be like, oh, I take off from this spot. He was so such a literal learner in so many parts of his his training. Um, And so I accidentally created a dog that took off too late. Mm -hmm. And that was my fault. And I I recognized it, thank God, and then backpedaled and then – you know, did some retraining, but um, jump grids were that side of jump grids wasn't helpful for the amount that I did it at. I think mm-hmm. if I'd done it less, it wouldn't have been a problem. But um, I think that there's some dogs that I've seen do tons of jump grids and it's um, almost taught them to be too thoughtful in agility, I find. Like it's actually taken some of their speed away. So I think with everything, you have to like evaluate the dog that you have and then decide like how much that dog needs because there's not enough and then there's also too much too much yeah Mm -hmm. so i don't know do you feel different differently than me on that no i don't at all Mm -hmm. um it's it's pretty similar to talking about dogs that um run in collection and people overtraining wraps and things like that i think it has similar results Mm -hmm. the other thing too is we'll get into um early takeoff um in, in a minute but i find like sometimes People will say, oh, like, oh, your dog has this jumping issue. You really need to do grids. And then people go and they do grids and they practice so religiously and it's great. And then they return back to the sequence and nothing has changed mm. because sometimes the dogs aren't able to take this and apply it to that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think it depends what the issue is. So I'm not knocking jump grids. I think all dogs should do. There's a, there's a benefit to them. I think all dogs should do them. And I think that there's some amazing um, grids out there to practice, you know, teaching the dog to balance it, to turn and how to weight shift. I think it's all amazing, but I think you just need to make sure you know the dog that you have and decide whether you're, you don't do it too much and don't do it too little, <laughs> which is maybe crazy advice because it's not very specific, but it's just like, Open your eyes and make a decision for your dog, basically, mm-hmm. is, is what I want to say on that. Um, toe tanglers. Oh, what, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you think about a toe dangler no. and how that's created? Toe danglers. <laughs> so we <laughs> – I love that. So often dogs um, – sometimes dogs can toe dangle because um, we just want to continue saying dangle because it's a hysterical word. Um, I find sometimes there'll be toe danglers if the person has laid information or like back to that rewarding thing where the dog's looking because often when the head goes up, the bum goes down and then mm-hmm. the dangles come out. And mm-hmm. they, they have a little dangle before they're as they're jumping and that can cause a lot of bar knocking. We're talking about toe danglers, but also we want to talk a little bit about bar knocking mm-hmm. as well because dogs knock bars for a whole whole bunch of reasons. But the- also decelling. When someone decels yeah. um and then the dog tries to correct correct itself Mm -hmm. and then the bars come down but it's generally because of a toe dangler because then they're turning (laughs) back and looking at the handler yeah or not overrunning that last jump Mm -hmm. um and then the dog jumps with his head up and feet down that's Uh, the worst uh that's the worst Mm -hmm. everything goes so great and then you knock the last bar because you're celebrating too early or you're like running into a fence or whatever the reason is yeah i find some dogs are more natural toe toe danglers than others though eh yeah like um some dogs are just, they default into that kind of movement more than others if they haven't had a lot of jump training. But I think um, bar knocking is is probably the most common um, jumping issue there is. Obviously, it seems like an obvious reason, but you really have to think about why the bar knocking is happening. Is it a takeoff issue? Is it a handling issue? Is it that the rewarding dog... Rewarding issue. Yeah. Is it the rewarding mm-hmm. issue? Does the dog actually not know the performance of that particular technique well enough? Is it with a specific technique? Yeah, because there's some there's some that cause yeah, that's that's a good point for mm-hmm. sure. I need to drink so you can talk. Oh. Um how would you fix the toe dangler? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> there was like I asked you a question as you were drinking. I know it was good. Um well, for the toe dangling this or it just we'll call it bar knocking now because yeah. it's not specifically about um about 
toad angles. Dogs that aren't necessarily thinking about jumping and they're going through the jumps rather than taking off for the jumps. A little yeah. bit more reckless. Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of fixing that, I think a, a lot of the time I see anyways with um, students' dogs or even even sometimes our own dogs that um, jumping performance gets better as the person gets better mm -hmm. and the training gets better because the information becomes early. There's lots of people who, you know, even we see it at seminars a lot. They start out at the beginning of the weekend, dogs doing a lot of bar knocking. We just tweak a couple things with their handling or their movement and then they'll often say to us oh my god my dog didn't knock any bars in that sequence yes. and you're like yeah because you were on time mm -hmm. and you were giving your dog great information so sometimes it, it actually is the person needs to improve not the dog mm -hmm. but not always no it could also be the highness of the dog mm -hmm. and the dog mm -hmm. really just wanting to push forward and not being very thoughtful on the, yep. how they how they take off yeah. So in terms of like correcting it or fixing it, I think, again, we've said this a million times already in this podcast, but it's dog dependent. So, mm -hmm. but I find in my experience anyway, most of the dogs that are bar knockers are the ones that are a bit more stim. Yeah. Um, a yeah, bit higher, higher minded, mm -hmm. um, where they just want to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think you're right because I think some of the dogs that aren't typically common um, in bar knocking, or there's some dogs that knock it and they're like, oh God, that, I didn't, that, I didn't mean that to. hurt me and I'll never do it again. <laughs> uh, and then you don't have to really have to worry about those dogs too much. Um, and then also too, you want to be careful that like, if you're going to start to mark bar knocking, which Jamie and I both believe in in marking bar knocking, which means when our dogs knock a bar, like we don't continue, we stop and we work it. But our dog's minds can handle that. Yeah. So if you listen to our podcast, um, our, I think it was the very first episode, we talked about building confidence um, in some, some of the training issues we've had with some of our dogs that were not quite as like high minded. And we spoke about the fact that we would not correct the dog for knocking the bars or something like that, those dogs, because they're more mm. sensitive. But we also have much higher minded dogs that don't really, didn't really care so much about knocking bars. So we had to kind of teach them, not that we're being super crazy about it, but we do want to acknowledge that it's just like missing a contact. Mm -hmm. Like you do not touch any part of the jump wing bar doesn't really matter. So you do need to know your dog and decide like how um, strict you're going to be on it. But what I want to say about bar knocking though, and people marking it though, is you have to have good timing because there's nothing that bugs me more than when dogs are bar knocking and then like three obstacles later or two obstacles later, the person's like, ah, lie down. It's like, well, <laughs> what could it happened? Yeah, back there. like <laughs> the poor dog, like you want to remember, like dogs are within one second. So if you're uh -huh. going to, if you're going to be marking bars, you have to have great timing or it's just not fair to the poor dog. Yeah. And you also have to know your dog because sometimes Dogs get exhausted very quickly, and yeah, that's when you to, yeah. see um, the bar starting to come down. So you want to make sure that if that's an issue, that you're stopping um, your before. coursework before the bars start coming down. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, too, is like know whether it's your fault or whether it's the dog's fault. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say that a lot of the time it, it would be the person's fault, like because they didn't give good enough information or whatever. And I wouldn't reward the dog for knocking the bar, but I might just be like, oops, my bad, like whatever, I'll try again. But I'm not going to like praise or reward the dog. Yeah. I'm just going to kind of be neutral and like not really. Move on. Yeah, not make it a big deal. Um, but then also too, like there's lots of times where like I feel like I did my job right and my dog was just being too high-minded yes. and she wasn't being thoughtful enough. And in that case, no go, babe. Mm -hmm. You need to like yeah. simmer down. And I, I experience see that a lot more in yeah. class than I do when I'm training on my own. I experienced that with my own dog, though, with, with a tunnel. Mm, so yeah. if there was um, Grin, a, right? yeah, yep. a jump before a tunnel, she would flatten out because she was thinking about moving forward into the tunnel. Yep. Yep. So I would set her up and, you know, if she did knock a bar, I would make her lie down and then we'd go back and try it again and trying to get her to be a little bit more yep. um, thoughtful and yep. with a toy placement um, closer to the tunnel mouth. Yeah. And so I love that you just said that because if you're going to um, mark bar knocking, you also need to then know how to train through it afterwards because just like marking it and then moving on isn't going to make change. What we really like to do is mark it like stop them, put the bar back up, have them jump it a few times and, you know, do our distraction, whatever. And then we will work through that section a couple times, whether we pre-place the toy to get the dog's um, head straighter, or if it's on a turn, we might um, move the toy to a different direction to get the head to turn more nicely. And then we would praise and reward and build the dog up. We're big believers in the attitude of the dog when you're running and making sure that if they learn to make a mistake, they don't die after. Like they just, okay, yeah, got it. I, you know, Moving on, let's try that again, kind of thing. Um, well, it's a win-win if we're 
if they're right. Mm-hmm. And then chances are when you go through the sequence again, we we see our dogs in our classes and our own dogs. They try harder in yeah. that moment. And then we often have to say, reward. Mm-hmm. Like, did you see what your dog yes. just did? Like, that was amazing. That's so. ha- that happens a lot, though, yeah. where someone People struggles. Move on. Yeah, they move on. And I get it. You know, you just want to kind of yeah. get past it. But the point is, is that you struggled at that point. So you, if the dog is successful, you should make note of that and reward the dog yeah. at that point. You should always be a dog trainer first. Yes. Dog trainer, then agility handler, because the better dog training you do, the better agility dog you're going to have. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Let's talk a little bit about takeoff uh, spot. So late takeoff and early takeoff. So um, I mentioned a little bit before that the ideal takeoff spot is when your dog takes off and lands with sort of equal distance on on either side. So if your dog's jumping in extension, they're going to take off a lot earlier and they're going to land a lot later after the jump. If your dog needs to collect, they should be going closer to the jump, taking off, but then they should be landing closer to the bar on the other side as well. So you want to, you want it to be as equal as possible if imagining your dog going straight. So late takeoff is when a dog, what it sounds like, they run and then they take off too late for the bar, which is what Grand Slam used to do. And, um, What I found then is he would end up knocking the bar sometimes with his front end, which is, it looks very peculiar sometimes. Oh, yes. Or sometimes he would knock it with like his, um, what is this called? Like a quad? Yeah, like like his thighs. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Is it weird to say dog's thighs? Uh, uh, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, he would take up late. So he was not a toe dangler. No. It was like, yeah, it was very strange looking. Well, well, it would be very hard to to take off properly if you're taking off so close to the jump. Oh, man. Anyways, how did you fix that? I um, I cried a lot. I I I remember those days. Uh, those were difficult days. Um, that's not how I fixed it, though. Um, I actually did. Uh, I taught a reverse set point, so I actually retrained him to take off um, uh, before. So rather than jumping between the set point mm-hmm. thing, I taught him to jump up, jump off before it. Okay. So basically, what I did is I I put a like a jump bump, mm-hmm. um, a few feet from the jump. And I would, I trained him to take off before the jump bump. Yep. And then I just started to push it back. So he wasn't allowed to step between it. Um, and it took me weeks to work on it. Um, and then That's not that bad, actually, though. No, and then he figured it out. Mm. And um, it, it was massively helpful. And it was some was it, it was something a, that you had to maintain no. throughout his his no. No, it wasn't. Um I think because it was not natural, it was I created it and so and I recognized it early, thank goodness. So I was able to like get better, get it back on the on the right track um pretty quickly. Um but uh yeah, I just I I had to but I didn't do any sequencing during that time. I would just like focus on jumps. Yeah, I would just focus on jumps. And I remember for a while like if there was jumps that had like a lot of turns and stuff in it, he could do those sequences just smooth as butter. But if there was like three jumps in a row, like initially when he was going through it was like I couldn't do three jumps in a row. He would just smash like all, extension jumps? Yeah. He mm-hmm. would just smash all three jumps because he couldn't figure out where he should take off between them. So I lowered the bars and then I practiced my little reverse set point thing and it really helped so much mm. um which was great um and then the uh which so i think dogs with late takeoff issues it's much easier to fix than dogs with early, early takeoff, takeoff issues so the early takeoff um issue it, it's it is actually a, a quite a large issue in our sport and um a lot of people will refer to it as ets so early takeoff syndrome and um we have seen so many dogs with with this issue and we've actually both owned dogs that have um those qualities yeah so we're not um we're not vets we're not um you know dog uh performance physio uh, physio rehab. experts and things like that and we won't prove to be uh this but through our own experience yeah everything we're talking about is through our own experience and you know We've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of dogs. So when you are in the sport for this long and you see this many dogs, you start to see trends and you start to see things that poke up that you're like, hmm, I've seen this before. And then you learn why you've seen it. And then you just see it dog after dog. So you really start to learn a lot more about this. And I feel that both of us know quite a bit about this based on the dogs that we've seen and also the dogs that we've owned. So mm-hmm. I I believe, and again, people can disagree with me, that when it comes to ETS, I don't really even like calling it that, but like we'll just refer to it that t- today because that's just what a lot of people call it. Um, it's that there's like a spectrum. So there's dogs that like have it really bad and then a little bit and then just Mild. minor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 
I think that for our own dogs, I had a dog named Ping Pong way back in the day, and I think she had a, it very mild. Mm-hmm. So actually, we should say what it is. So it's like a perception issue. So it's for dogs that can't really figure out where to take off. No. And you'll also see this when they go up the stairs at home, jumping into your car, jumping Stuttering. onto your couch. Like they they hesitate a little bit because they don't really know where they should take off. And a lot of times in agility, these particular dogs, they take off way way too early. So they'll take off and sometimes they'll land on the bar and they can actually get like really hurt. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty serious. Like Mm -hmm. you have to be really careful with it. Um, The other thing too is they'll stutter before they take off. Some dogs won't stutter. They'll just take off and like fling themselves at the jumps. Um, I was going to say something else and I can't really remember what it was all of a sudden. Take off early. Oh, oh, I remember. Um, those dogs, um, they sometimes, they judge the jump looking at the wing and not the bar. Oh, yeah. So they don't necessarily look at the bar. They look at the wing. And we have a little test that we do with yeah. a lot of dogs that, that you can use to see whether your dog has this or not or has a case of it. But what were you going to say? Um, through my own experience, I had actually two dogs that have – ETS. Mm -hmm. Um, One, I was able to continue to do agility with, and the other, I decided to not do agility because it was so significant that Mm -hmm. um, I I think it was was dangerous for his body. Like, I just thought that he would easily get injured, and it wasn't worth it. But um, for my dog that ended up doing agility with ETS, I did learn so- some things through it. Um, I ended up getting the dog's eyes tested. Yep. Um, nothing showed up. It, the eye That's test common, came, actually. came back normal. Mm-hmm. Um, I had, um, you know, I had her looked at, her body looked at. She didn't have any luxated patellas. Those things could come up as well. Um, but if I were to go back with this specific dog, I would do things differently. Um, for some reason, she was a little Boston Terrier and I so thought <laughs> she was really cute. Um, I, I don't know why, but I jumped her at 10 inches and I probably shouldn't have. I mm, think I that, think that was like what you did back then. Yeah. But I, I like didn't know. Was it like was green. Years yes, ago now. It was green. I didn't know better. Um, but I think that it would have been kinder for the dog. Um, and it would have made things a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. Um, if I decided to jump her at like six inches um, or, you know, four inches and, yeah. and not really worry about the height. I'm not sure why I was convinced that she had to jump 10 inches. I, I really don't know why. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would do things differently. Yeah. The dog that I had had it very mild and she didn't knock bars very much, but she did take off a little earlier. And I mostly saw it on like um, spread jumps and like double yes. jumps, uh-huh. but normal jumps, it wasn't really that that bad. Um, I also noticed for a lot of dogs with, uh, with this issue, they're worse on jumping straight than they are turns or slices. Yes. They slice okay. They turn okay. Like if it's like a wrap, it's not as bad. Um, some, some dogs. Um, but when they have to take it straight, it's it's much more challenging. Yeah, that was my experience with it. my own dog as well. And I've other, noticed that with our students' dogs too. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that the jumps that she would jump over, they were red on both sides. And then in the <sighs> middle, there was a white part. Yeah. And she would never jump over the, the red, red parts and would always jump over the white part and i'm yeah. not i really i'm not sure what that was about but it was it was obvious yeah. that that's what she Funny, was doing. Eh? Mm-hmm. And it could be, you know, some of it could have been taught. I, this was my first dog. I really didn't know mm-hmm. kind of what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't know what jump height I started jumping her at. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really don't recall. But yeah. um, Do you believe that you can fix ETS? I don't know. I, I don't know. I think that um, – I think that you can – help them become more confident Mm -hmm. jumpers. I I agree. But I I think that... I think it depends on how bad they have it. Yes. I think how bad the issue is. I think that if it's really, really bad, I think that in some cases it can be dangerous to run them. So you do have to be careful. And lowering the jump heights is a great suggestion. Um, Also teaching them to jump um, like... Back in the day, we used to call it stick stick jumping. So you would just hold the bar out, like no wing. You just hold it in in your hand, and you teach the dog to jump back and forth over a Mm -hmm. pole. So they learn to do the the pole jumping can be really helpful. Um, And then set points can be really helpful. Jump grids can be helpful, but it doesn't always transfer. No, because it's when you change the spacing of the jumps that's when the dogs struggle Mm -hmm. 
more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, anyways, it is it is a thing. It's something. It's that a you touchy have to be subject. Aware of. It is a touchy subject. We we've had lots of students that we've noticed it. Uh, we've noticed it in foundation level, um, and then often we've spoken, you know, privately between the two of us and said, eh. Do, do, what do you do? You see it? I think I see it. Let's just mm-hmm. let's just wait because some people are get really angry mm-hmm. and ab- emotional about it. About it. Yeah. I, I think that I was emotional about it when yeah. I first discovered that it was an issue for my dog. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's crappy. But just most of the time when that happens, um, it, when it, people it, are telling you it's coming from a good place, yeah, it's not coming. You know, it's coming to educate and to help the handler out and to help the dog out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and know too that it's not really something that like the handler did wrong. It's no. it's just something that happens. Um, But anyways, let's move off this topic because it's sad. (laughs) Um, Okay. Um, One thing that uh, we kind of mentioned this before, but maybe it's worth talking about again is training turns too much and too early. So this can also cause um, jumping issues. Um, Actually, I think you did mention this before a little bit about like balancing your training out. So it doesn't really matter whether you have a young dog or whether you have, you know, you know, a dog that you've been doing agility with year for years. You do want to make sure that you're balanced in your training in terms of of jumping. I think that that's um, I think that's really important. And I think that also leads into the topic of jump height, because um, um, the jump height can impact your dog's jumping style and how good or how not so good it can be. Um, I know we were talking just the other day about um, jump heights because you have a you have a eight month old uh, dog and you were wondering about like when to go up and like mm-hmm. what you should kind of do with him. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that in terms of like when you should put the bars up. Um, I know. I know we have a certain way that we that we do things, but I know when I'm like looking on Facebook or all the other places that you see like people with young dogs, um, people are kind of all over the place with this, I find. There's some people that I find I feel are jumping their dogs too high too early. Mm-hmm. And I sometimes think the dog's jumping style looks a bit like um, – Forced? Yeah, mm-hmm. not not smooth. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also I'm just so panic stricken about – injury in this in this sport Mm -hmm. that I often think like why if you don't have to why Mm -hmm. like why do it now um but then I also see the opposite where people jump their dogs so low for so long that Mm -hmm. that also causes jumping issues as well those dogs typically jump off late um for the bars Mm -hmm. um and they also run uh very forward like Mm -hmm. a lot of their weight is in their front of their body which uh which can cause bar knocking and um, they have a hard time turning when you do put the bars up because they turn great with it low, but they actually haven't learned how to run up to a bar, sit back, and then take off because they don't have to when the jumps are so low. Mm-hmm. So when you put them up is 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 important. And I don't want to say like, okay, when you have this breed or this dog at this age, you should be this height, this age, you should be this height because it doesn't really work It's like not that. black and white. It's kind of dog dependent. Yeah. Like, do you have a male? Do you have a female? That makes a difference. Do you have a small breed? Do you have a large breed? Yeah. Like, think about like Beeline. She's a, she's like a, a just under 16 inch border collie, which is highly unusual. I was able to go through the jump heights much more differently uh, with her than I did Rad, who was like a 21 inch male border collie. I did do things very different with him. Both border collies, but one male, one female in significant size difference. <laughs> and um, also um, uh, coordination. Mm-hmm. Like B was way coordinated when she was small because of her height and because female. Um, and then Rad, remember how like goofy and awkward he was? He had I a mean, bit of crazy legs You had long. Rad's sister, mm-hmm. or have Rad's sister, um, Grin. And she, she progressed through a lot of things more gracefully than he did for a while there because they just weren't He went through same. an awkward stage. Oh, he sure did. Yeah. Poor Rad. Yeah. <laughs> um, But yeah, so I don't really want to say like at this age you should do this, but I do think that you should just watch and see. I think that... um, The style will tell you. mm -hmm. And also too, like if you're doing like one jump stuff or like things that are a little bit closer, like for example, Jamie has an eight month old dog. So I said that you could do like 12 or 14 inches Mm -hmm. and do some like straight lines or whatever. Um, And then maybe in like a month or so, if you're going to do like one jump stuff or like close in tight stuff, put the jump up a little higher. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you know, technically, they're able to jump full height by the time they, they're a year and a half because you could compete Pete. with them by then. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do or that. Or that's the right decision for that dog. Yeah. So you mm. just sort of have to be be aware. Um, the other thing with jump heights um, that we were going to talk about was lead outs. Um, what did you want to say about lead outs? 
Um, I think that that can also affect the dog's confidence on how um, the dog is jumping and their style, um, especially with an inexperienced dog. I find that if you're leading out um, too far, you might not get the same confidence if you're a bit closer to the dog. Yeah. Um, the other thing I find too is um, th- the environment in which you're jumping can affect mm. the dog. Yeah. So if you're jumping um, a straight grid and trying to create extension, but you're jumping into a wall, my dog, uh, my young dog, will check up a stride before he takes yeah, off for um, the last jump. Um, just I think because of the pressure of the jump. So what I've done to kind of kibosh that is I've eliminated the um, an extra jump to make more space so uh, that he's running more freely to the end rather than putting in an extra stride yeah, to that's smart. slow down. And um, I ha- remember I had to do the opposite with slam because remember when he used to do a jump grid and I would put the toy at the end, he would like grab the toy and then somersault because yes. he would be going so fast yes, to get the crash. toy like he wouldn't slow down. So for him, I used to put my toy up on top of an upside down bucket. Remember that? Oh, I, yep, I totally remember yep. that. Or sometimes I, I, put, that, I would though. put food on a pedestal or food on a chair so that he would actually have to slow down and like like lift his head to get the reward because if it was on the ground, he would just grab it and then just keep on going. <laughs> I was like, oh God, you need to slow down. Uh, also where you leave your dog in relationship to the first jump mm-hmm. is helpful too. Like I think there's a sweet spot for a lot of dogs where they like can take one or two strides before they take off or, or whatever. Um, and then the last thing would be like um, – position to leave them in sit stand down and i know lots of people will do different things i personally think the best the best (laughs) the best thing is a sit Mm -hmm. um but like a tall sit so we jame and i in our training we teach um a like a little trick called sit up where uh because we both struggled with our dogs like vulture sitting so like literally the longer you leave them like their nose almost but, touches the ground like a like a gargoyle I think or it's something genetic, though. <laughs> oh my god but then what happens is their weight is so forward then they go to take off of the first jump like somersault yeah they look ridiculous so um several dogs ago we started teaching sit up so if we lead out and the dogs all bent over like a little gargoyle we'll We'll say sit up and then they'll position. Yep. Bring their head back and sit, sit up nice and tall. And then we'll release them. That works really nicely. Um, I think leaving the dog in a stand is okay sometimes as well, but the dog needs to stay in the Mm -hmm. stand because a lot of dogs aren't good at that. They walk and walk and walk and walk. So they have to stay still Mm -hmm. down is my least favorite, but I do find that, um, if the people are having starline issues or like want to kind of keep their dog on the toes a little bit, then you could also leave them in a down just but to farther back. thinking, but farther back. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because then they have a, the ability to get up and then take a few strides and then yeah. take off for the jump. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Um, okay. The last thing that we want to talk about is just like training jumps and kind of thinking about the importance of jump training. And uh, I think I said this at the very beginning of the podcast that the jumps are the most common obstacles on it's the, the most course. most they take. It's the most common thing that you can get a refault on, whether you knock the bar, get a refusal, whatever it might be. So they really, they really do deserve a lot of training. And to be perfectly honest with you, over the years, I feel that I'm – I like jump training probably more than a lot of other training in agility. Mm-hmm. I I have these like little drills that I do. I have like maintenance things that I do. I have certain things that, that I focus on and I really, really enjoy doing them. And they're easy to do because you just need – one jump. You don't need a lot of space. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, they're great to implement into your warm up routine before going into a trial. There's lots of things that you can do, but I think it's really important. Um, you said this uh, before we started about rewarding for contacts and weaves and how to balance that out. Yeah, because we do tons of um, contact training, t- tons of weave training, and the dogs learn to do those fast in our criteria. And then they love them. Yeah, and they end up loving them. Um, but what we've seen in class is that they'll get to the contacts and they'll do an awesome dog walk and then they come off the dog walk and they go to a jump and the performance is not the same. Yeah. So just making sure that you're rewarding 
jumps as well as the other things, yeah. of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially too, if you do, if your dog does have jumping issues, you have bar knocking issues or whatever, whatever it might be, you need to make sure that you don't just continue because sometimes jumps sort of seem like they're like the vehicle to get your dog from like this thing to this thing. But like they're, 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 don't forget about them. They're their own entity. <laughs> <laughs> they're like their own thing. So you need to make sure that you're on the lookout for like really good performance. And I will often just stop and reward if like I get a great turn or if I really think she looked really great taking that Balanced. jump. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll stop and, and make a deal of it. Or sometimes too, I'll just like, yes, her. Of mm-hmm. course, we won't even stop. I'll just like acknowledge, hey, I love that you put that extra stride in or whatever. You set it might yourself be. up for that backside yeah. really nicely. Yeah, I have a, a specific um, – a visual idea of how I want her to take it. And then when she's able to replicate that or she's able to do it, I I try to make sure I always acknowledge it because it makes a big deal. Um, And I really think it's important that you do take the time to train your dog to jump. Like there are some dogs out there that are just naturally beautiful jumpers despite the person's experience or ability or whatever. Um, We have a couple dogs in our classes that we always say like, my God, that dog is a specimen. Like (laughs) it moves so beautifully, so naturally all on its own. And we know that the dog hasn't had the type of training that we would give and it's still so great. But that's not always the case. Some dogs um, do require a lot of training and then they can be Look, take Slam, for example. You know, he's a beautiful jumping dog, Mm -hmm. but I had to work my ass off to get there Mm -hmm. because of whatever. Um, I I think he was a – I think he's a gifted dog to begin with. But anyways, I screwed him up when we talked about that. But I think um, (laughs) – I think that training your dog how to jump is really, really important. And I think that it should be – I think it should be a major part of your – Training. Your weekly training Mm -hmm. routine for sure. And maintained. And maintained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because things can slide if you're starting to do a lot of competitions or whatever. um, And maybe one of these things are going to be more of a focus, Mm -hmm. right, than Mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I I really hope that you guys were able to get something from today's podcast. I think it's a really interesting subject. It's something that, um, you know, this is called the After Class Podcast. And I would say that (laughs) jumping is something that we do we honestly do spend a lot of time, whether it's we're talking about our own dogs or we're brainstorming about students' dogs and like what we can do to help better their jumping performance or wherever it might be. But it is absolutely a common topic that you and I talk about on a regular basis. And um, I think that it's, it's a topic in agility that I don't think a lot of people really know a lot about. And I think that the more that people are educated on some of the different things that happen and what they can do to, to work through them or, or prevent them. Or if you don't know, ask. Mm-hmm. It's just going to it's just gonna make your dog an even better agility dog. And I think on top of that, um, the better they jump, the safer they're going to be, the longer they're going to be able to play agility, the less injury they're going to have. So it really is so, so important to take the time to, to focus on uh, on jumping because it's um, it's a common thing. So thanks for listening, guys. I really hope you enjoyed um, this week's uh, episode and um, we'll hopefully see you back for the next one. Ciao. See you. Thanks for listening to our McCann Dogs Agility Podcast. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out the links in the show notes below. On that note, happy training.